I've been on the Junior Doctors Committee for the last three years and on the executive of the JDC, the Junior Doctors Committee, over the last year. Now, all of you will know that, the, that we junior doctors have been through a period of unprecedented industrial action. It's unprecedented in the history of the BMA and unprecedented in the history of the NHS. And in common with trade unionists throughout time and in other occupations, we're fighting for the right to determine the conditions under which we work. We're also fighting for the right to a flourishing life, both inside of work and outside of the workplace. And specifically, in our role as NHS workers, we're fighting to defend the ongoing viability of the NHS going <coughs> forward. Now, of course, all of you will also know that the NHS has been under attack for many years now, from all angles. And over those years, we've considered the enemies of the NHS as quite formidable indeed. The current contract dispute has not arisen out of the blue. It's arisen in intricate connection with previous health policy decisions. For example, over the last decade, we've been seeing accelerating privatisation within the NHS. We've been seeing a willful defunding of the NHS. And of course, we've had top-down reorganisation after top-down reorganisation. Not only the well-known and notorious Health and Social Care Act of 2012, but also the five-year forward view and the sustainability and transformation plan which are being mooted right now. And it could also be argued that the junior doctor's contract in position by government is another top-down reorganisation. But now, finally, we're having the fight. And the decision by the BMA to stand up against this government and call for industrial action made last September was probably the single most positive thing that has occurred in NHS politics over the last few decades. We went on six batches of industrial action, with the last a couple of months ago being the first full walkout by junior doctors in English history. The public stayed with us, and I think the public will stay with us going forward if we were to further embark on, if we were to embark on further industrial action. I'd like to thank a few of you here who, throughout this time period, have really played a great part in supporting us, in coming along to our pickets, in publicising our views in your publications, and of course in inviting us to such occasions such as this. And I think it's become really evident that over the last year the BMA has slowly but surely started to emerge from its self-imposed isolation from the wider workers' movement. We've benefited hugely from the experience of other campaigning groups and from the experience of other trade unions, and we've been deeply moved as well as educated We've organised rallies up and down the country on our strike days in association with other trade unions. The postal workers have distributed leaflets for us throughout the networks. The tube drivers distributed badges. And of course the firefighters, but in <coughs> here in London, lent us their fire trucks to take around the Meet the Doctors events which we were holding. We took our message to the public from the top of an FBU fire truck. And most recently in London, as well as elsewhere, and I'm sure you'll hear about that, the BMA co-organised very successful rallies with the National Union of Teachers. The last bit of such rally being on the, at the end of our first full walkout. <coughs> we had Corbyn and McDonald speak at that rally. We had Mark Sawatka of the PCS also speak at that rally and Kevin Carney of the NUT. And I think we should just dwell on that for a moment. <coughs> incidentally, the attendance by Jeremy Corbyn at our rally was probably the first ever occasion, definitely the first in many decades, where a Labour leader has marched with, stri with striking workers on a day of industrial action. <coughs> so the symbolism of that event shouldn't be underestimated. So the conversation's changed, the conversation is changing, and the BMA will be reciprocating the support that other unions have shown to us over the next few months. For example, only last week, the former chair of the Junior Doctors Committee, Johan Malawana, issued a historic statement of support to the NUT, who are in the midst of their own industrial dispute. <coughs> so I think we're in a good place compared to where we were a year ago, but this isn't by any measure over. Because of course we live in times of fracture and transformation, and the BMA is being influenced by the unprecedented times in which we live. Only last week we saw the close of our own two-week referendum period on the latest iteration of the proposed junior doctor's contract. And junior doctors and final and penultimate year medical students voted on whether the current contract is acceptable to them, whether it's acceptable to the NHS. And the results were announced last Tuesday gone, a few days ago. 
on a solid 68% turnout, we had a 58% vote no to the contract and 42% vote yes. And we can speak about the meaning of those figures maybe in the discussion. Now, <coughs> it must be said that over the course of this dispute, we have actually indeed won a significant number of concessions from government off the back of both the threat and action of industrial action. But there is still some way to go. The proposed contract is not objectively as good or better than the contract we currently labour under. And the no vote to the latest iteration of the contract, which incidentally was endorsed by the former chair of the JDC, was always likely and was actually necessary. And I believe that the members, the grassroots doctors and medical students, came to an objective judgment on the contract. So off the back of a no vote, a substantial no vote, we need to be ready to escalate our fight against the government, which is quite literally on its knees. And whether or not we are forced to engage in further industrial action, we need to make sure, the JDC needs to make sure that we maintain the legacy of this dispute. We need to make sure it's maintained and nurtured going forward and that the BMA remains a fighting union. Probably over the next one or two years, there will be debates within the BMA as to what this industrial dispute actually meant, and that meaning will be contested. So as I've mentioned, we are in a much better place than we were. We junior doctors actually started this whole journey from a relatively weak position. We were poorly organized on a local level. We were inexperienced in delivering industrial action. Significant proportions of the, ju of the junior doctor workforce were relatively apolitical. But I think we've really come a long way, and our trajectory is the direct opposite of this government's trajectory. So the decision that lies before us as junior doctors and as members of the JDC is whether we become passively complicit with the rollout of the new contract, which we know will erode the viability of our profession, or whether we decide to resist with all of our might. It's a deeply gender regressive contract. It's a pretty ambiguous contract as well. NHS managers looking to make so-called efficiency savings within our willfully defunding NHS will take advantage of that ambiguity. And it's a contract which doesn't adequately recognize the special nature of unsocial hours work. Now some would say, and some will say going forward, that we need to be very careful about how we proceed, given that this government is in disarray. Because they claim an incoming government may be even more right-wing and even more likely to rip up some of the protections afforded to us by the EU. But I think many within the JDC, myself included, would argue that actually now is the time to ramp things up if we're serious about achieving what we set out to achieve a year ago. And I think a government's the government's capitulation on this issue is very, very possible if we choose to make it so. If we need to escalate, we escalate. Now as I draw to a close, I'd just like to say one or two personal points. Now, the BMA is and always has been and is always likely to remain non not unaffiliated to any particular political party. And there are some very good arguments to remain unaffiliated to any polit particular political party. So bearing that in mind, I just want to take off my BMA hat and speak to you in my personal capacity as a junior doctor who's been working in the NHS for the last eight years, day in, day out, in hospitals around London. <coughs> and over that time, I've seen an NHS squeezed by austerity. I've seen an NHS finding it increasingly difficult to deliver safe patient care. I've seen a demoralized workforce, an exhausted NHS workforce. I've seen dangerously low staffing levels, A&E closures, underfunded ambulance services. And having seen all of this, I say to you that if you want an NHS in existence in 2020, or in 2030, or in 2040, do get involved in the class struggle. And the epicenter of that class struggle is, and will remain, I believe, within the Labour Party. And at this very moment, of course, the leadership of the Labour Party and the membership are being subjected to a vicious attack from the establishment. So if you're going to defend the rights of NHS workers, if you're going to defend the NHS itself, itself we can only achieve that through a mass movement, a mass movement through the Labour Party to defend social democracy in this country. Thanks very much. Thank you.